Nikki, bro, how you doing? I am spectacular, brother. An honor to be here with you today. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure, man. So what's new, man? What's happening in this economic, let's call it pause right now, where I, I call it a fucking full-blown recession, man. We're in interesting times right now. Yeah, you know, you're right. I just saw the U.S. job report. There's another 4.4 million people uh, put in for unemployment. So all the job gains made since 2008 have been completely wiped away by this. And it's uh, it, 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 it's a sad time. It's a scary time. Yet it also has me be one of those voices like yourself, Amir, that is questioning whether all this is truly necessary and what can we do right now to like pivot and get out of it. You know, I put up a, a Venn diagram, which had, you know, three types of people, people who are uh, taking COVID seriously, people who are concerned about economic impact of the shutdown and people who are concerned about authoritarian government overreach and where they intersect is where I am, you know? And I, I think that all of us need to kind of take this thing a little bit seriously. I mean, it's not nothing. It's a, it's a real thing. I, I finally have the first people in my life that actually have it that I know, but mm. they're both doing fine, right? They're both in their mid to late sixties, good friend of mine and his wife, and they're both doing fine. He said he was sicker three weeks ago before he was diagnosed. So, you know, obviously it's a real thing, but it's also something that we got to really be careful because the, the, the bad guys out there want to use this as an excuse to like tamp down our rights and freedoms and shut down our ability to be economically independent. Yeah, the response that the governments have been doing have been obscene. I think it's just all for a power grab. I think what we're going to play out both in every country around the world is – you have the federal government that is uh, working with the central ba banks, or in case of both Canada and the United States, our central banks, printing out money. The interesting dynamic, though, is you have, for example, provinces in Canada that have more debt federally. Ontario has more provincial debt than federal debt, which is crazy. And it so is. it's insane, right? So it's a power grab right now for handouts as well. You, you're going to see elongated closures. You're going to see people ex escalating this and prolonging this disaster. You know, what's that saying? Politicians never let a good disaster go to waste. Exactly. You know, they're politicians, man. Um, incompetent people. And uh, it's hilarious. I don't know this. I don't know this woman. I have nothing against her. Uh, but you look at, for example, Finland's Ministry of Health, and she's morbidly obese. I'm like, how is it a morbidly obese person, Ministry of Health? Or you look at Ministry of Finance in some country, never ran a business, never ran a private business, but yet the Ministry of Finance. Or you look at any of these so-called leaders within the government, they've never, they have zero ex real, real expertise. Now I'm talking about bureaucratic, go to Harvard, you know, work with your buddies' buddies and get voted in type of expertise. I'm talking about real world expertise. So I think we're in it for a very long haul. And I think a lot of the politicians and both municipal and provincial are going to elongate this and use this as use this as an opportunity to suck up as much cash as, cash as possible for the federal government. Agreed, one hundred percent. And on top of that, they're gonna they're using this to see how people are going to react. Since people in Canada, especially, have not been reacting against this power grab in this curtailing of civil liberties, they're going to be able to do this in the future as well. And they've set a precedent for it, which I'm I'm a little bit concerned about. Look, I, I happen to know the premier of Ontario. I consider him, you know, a friend. We're not close friends, but he's a friend. When my lady Teresa was running to set a world record back in 2012, Doug helped us out. He came and he's he was there we had to have like a government official be there to certify it if we didn't want to pay their fee we paid it in the future when she did it again but that time he came he helped us out he's a good guy he's run a business he gets all this stuff but i i see him man with all these experts around him telling him no you gotta do this you gotta shut everything down you can't open anything else up and i'm like guys look at the number of deaths in ontario like i'm every death is a tragedy right like every death is something that we are not in favor of I'm not one of these guys who goes, oh, it's okay, Cavalier, let people die. BS, no, keep people alive. But the number of deaths that we've had in Ontario is very small. Like more people die in a week in Ontario from tons of other stuff like auto accidents and heart disease and cancer and the impact of 
excuse me, obesity. I just had my protein drink. Sorry, a bit of it <laughs> came up. <laughs> but you know, it, it was it's 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 the type of thing where yes, let's take it seriously, but does take it seriously mean shut the whole society down? I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to go forward. You look at a country like Sweden, okay? Now, Sweden did a lot of things incorrectly, but Sweden has not shut everything down. They have been able to manage to flatten the curve. And the number of deaths there, you know, it's still, you know, high, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 deaths. I don't know what the latest count is, but when I saw it a couple of days ago, it was around 1,500 or so. They are still managing to allow people to get on with the business of living. And Sweden is supposedly, uh, you know, a left-wing country, right? Yeah. Like with a left-wing tradition in how they run their government. And here in North America, we are supposedly the people that believe in liberty more. And don't tread on me is the state motto of, of New Hampshire, which ought to be the state motto of every living human being, right? Don't tread on me. And we we just meekly allowed this to happen with no debate. I don't mind that people say, look, we need to take certain steps. Let's have that argument. But don't shut down argument by saying that the people who don't agree with what you're doing have concerns about government overreach, have concerns about the economy tanking, like completely being obliterated, are somehow bad because they don't care about people. BS, we care about people. And part of the reason that we're saying what we're saying is because we care about people. Amir, imagine if people can't buy food. Can you imagine the civil unrest, the number of deaths that will take place if people feel they can't buy food? Hey, we might get there. If you look at the supply chain, what's happening with China right now and the OPEC oil wars going on. Um, so, you know, a lot of the it's going to it's, it's interesting. I'm more interested to see how, you know, they talk about reopening the economy. It's not like an on off switch. You have United States figures just came out, as you mentioned earlier, around 28 million unemployed. You have Canada, they're talking up to 10 million unemployed. That's one quarter of the population in Canada unemployed, 25% unemployment. And some people are speculating even higher. You're having small businesses completely shut down. And another thing that people don't understand, you have these helicopter money coming in and paying off two thousand, up to $2,000 a month, depending on who you are. And if you calculate that per hour, it comes down to $16 an hour, roughly, to just sit on your ass to be at home. Now, my speculation is a lot of this helicopter money will stay here. It's some new kind of twisted form of UBI. I don't think so. Any politician is going to take away this money. They're going to use this as an opportunity to get themselves voted in. And you already see a lot of small businesses on, on very, very tight margins. They can't afford that $16 an hour because why would somebody go to work? when they can just sit at home and get $16 an hour. So there's early data and stats coming in saying that labor shortage already because people just don't want to work because why would I work for $14 an hour when I can just sit on my ass at home and get paid for $16 an hour? You know what, brother? There's a lot of truth to what you're saying. And I am 100% against UBI. I know you and I have a mutual friend, Floyd, who's a huge UBI guy. And I, I don't even understand his thinking around that because this is a guy who didn't rely on UBI. This is a guy who used his ingenuity to build himself a fabulous business, yet he thinks this is a good idea. He thinks that taking away incentives for people to like be hungry is actually good for them. The truth of the matter is at, at, a, at, a, at a core deep level, we are primal creatures. When we feel like life is happening for us on the edge is when we're most fully alive. UBI kills that. UBI is like a narcotic. Mm -hmm. And you don't want a narcotic. You want something that's going to have you sharp on your edge, ready to get out there. People who have UBI are going to fall flat on their butts. People who don't have UBI are going to get creative. They're going to get out there and say, if it's to be, it's up to me. And they're going to make things happen. So I'm 100% against UBI. I think that UBI is an insidious evil that all it's going to do is allow the forces of evil, which the modern left, in my opinion, represents the epitome of the forces of darkness and evil. And if those forces are allowed to be in control, they're going to sedate the entire population and they're going to have a few overlords be in charge. It's going to be like a Caudillo run Latin American country from the 1900s where there's just a few people in charge and very rich and everybody else is very, very poor, depending on crumbs from the overlords. Screw that. Yeah, I th the thing is, most people don't look at second order thinking or third order thinking. They look at like instant gratification. Mm. And 
if we're going to play this out, things is things are never going to be normal. We have multiple things going on right now. As I mentioned, we have an oil war going on. Yep. We've had a very fr fragile ecosystem when it comes to the economy. I'm the first one to admit we don't live in a free market. We live in a very closed, privatized, uh, I wouldn't even call it privatized, I call it elitist market where very select few get bailout money. The market, like you think about this, the five, five top stocks on the S&P control more than 85% of total market share. And right. all of them have been doing buybacks since 08. And they've just been injecting trillions and trillions of dollars. The debt is so bad in the United States that the Fed had to create a special vehicle. So a special vehicle fund, SPV, to buy out all the junk bonds. Because legally, the Fed can't buy out the junk bonds. So they created a subsidiary to buy out the junk bonds. We're coming to a point where right now in the last six months or say three months, there has been more than $10 trillion injected within the United States. Yep. And so the question is, like, people understand all this money being printed, all this helicopter money being added, supply chain being decreased, oil wars going on, the economy being shut down, 28 million jobs. They think that the economy is just going to start again. They think that they're going to have the same type of quality of living that they did before. They're insane. They are insane. It's not going to be the same uh, for the average person. Yet. All, I, I also want to sound a bit of an optimistic note because times like this can be times of tremendous opportunity for those who are alert, who are looking for opportunity, and who are looking for ways to take advantage of a disruption. So if you look at all the major disruptions that have happened in economies in the last century or so, every single time there's been a major disruption – there have been innovators that have come in, taken advantage of that seemingly out of nowhere and become huge Fortune 50 type companies. So example, in the in the height of the Great Depression, JW Marriott started Marriott hotel chains. Like in 1930 freaking eight, where everyone said, you're out of your mind, buddy, <laughs> right? And, and yet he did. And Marriott right now is the world's largest hospitality and hotel chain. Now they're, they're in trouble for that reason. Yeah. But that's a different story. Hershey chocolate's a good example too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, so back in the uh, recession of 2008, a lot of the tech companies were either just starting up or if they'd been around, they were not very large at that point in time, right? Like folks like Twitter, folks like Facebook, right? All these guys came out of that time and all of a sudden they just boomed, kazoomed, went up into a huge place. I have friends of mine who are real estate guys, who are basically broke in 2007, right? In 2008, they said, okay, I'm going to go find a few of my buddies who have money, and they did that, and I'm going to go to the States, uh, and I'm going to go buy up properties. So I know two guys who did that specifically. One guy had a $2.5 million fund he raised, and he went to Arizona, he went to Chicago, he went to Philadelphia, and right now this guy's worth almost $100 million out of that. Mm -hmm. you know, and he was broke in 2007, like broke, 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 broke. So it shows me that for people who are alert, this can be a time of opportunity. So you and I were talking about this. Urban farming is something that I think really is going to take off. People who are involved in, in food businesses, people who are involved in businesses that are about providing the types of staples that no matter what people are going to need, these folks are doing really well. And some of the big pharma companies, obviously, they're doing well. You know, guys like Abbott Labs, Abbott Labs, with all the tests they've come up for coronavirus is now the darling of the stock world. They can't make mm -hmm. they can't make the stuff they're selling to the governments uh, and individual private labs fast enough. Right. And then there's um, additionally companies like 3M because 3M manufactures a lot of this medical equipment. 3M has been a sleepy stock for like 30 years. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, 3M is like shooting through the freaking roof. Mm -hmm. because they make all this stuff. So obviously. There are opportunities, and even for people starting out in business right now, if you are alert, you're thinking about what's going on in there, there are definitely opportunities you can take advantage of. And I'd love to even have you share what some of your thoughts are about these opportunities. You mentioned farmland, so I've been in farmland for a while, and I know a bunch of farmers. I think urban farming is going to be really important. So if you look at Maslow Hiker needs going in the future with the recession, depression, 
um, you have food and you have shelter. That's the most important thing. But underlining, I had Chris McIntosh on here. He runs a fund and we've been talking about contrarian places to start investing money. And if you look at the underlining uh, infrastructure of farmland, the number one thing is energy. So I think local energy, local energy and local food supply is going to be huge industries. Like if you look at Ontario for the last four or five years, farmland in general has outperformed any real estate. It's a 10% return per year in Ontario. Not to, not to mention it's a cash flow. Forget cash flow. Like uh, Curtis Stone, he's an urban farmer. I know him. He's in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. There's a bunch of other urban, urban farmers I know. But you look at a quarter acre plot. On a quarter acre plot, depending on how you plot and depending on what you're doing, whether it's like regenerative farming, polyphase farming, circular farming, you can do a yield of up to like $200,000 if you do circular farming per quarter acre. Wow. So That's think about that. Money. It's yeah. a lot of money, not to mention the appreciation of the land. So this outperforms most real estate classes out there. And not to mention the more focus on localized food supply. So if I'm a contrarian, even though the oil markets are getting tanked, I think oil is still massive. Oil, especially here in Canada, 10% of our GDP is associated to the oil market. It is. So if I'm a contrarian betting man, I'm not betting on renewables going into the future. I'm betting on oil because oils oil is now a hundred times cheaper than any. This is what people understand about like economics. Why would I invest in super expensive renewables when I can literally get oil for free? Yeah. For free. For free. <laughs> no. They'll pay me to store it. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing, right? West Texas crude went negative for the first negative. time in history. Negative. <laughs> and we'll see what happens to those options in June. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah, no, we'll see. But, you, you know, here's the thing. What you're saying makes so much sense, right? Uh, you know, the there's a congresswoman in the United States. Her name is Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. And she's like a 29-year-old former bartender Obviously, she's an that actress, man, I guarantee you she's put in that position. Right. So, you know, former bartender, she obviously has a lot of knowledge about economics and social trends and the environment. Right. She clearly like I'm being facetious. And she said, oh, man, it's really great that all these people in the oil industry are losing their jobs. So she's thrilled that one point seven million families are losing their jobs. Good one. Good one from the party of the common man, the Democratic Party. It's the same and thing, though, in Canada, though. So, for example, I made a post about this. You People are cheering for the oil collapsing. But I tell them, listen, the biggest pension plan in Canada has almost 70% of their funds invested in the oil market. If the oil market goes down in Canada, regardless of if you're not in the oil industry, your pension fund goes, guess where? Oof, oof. Yeah, and there, there's truth to that. And with all due respect to Mademoiselle Ocasio-Cortez, she's completely wrong about the oil industry. Right now, the oil industry is the most attractive it's ever been. Nobody out there in the energy business is going to go, oh, let me invest in wind. Let me invest in solar. They're all going, oil's so freaking cheap. Let's buy all the oil we can mm -hmm. because- it's going to come back. You know what? Listen, in the United States, the president there is a former entrepreneur, son of a rich man who, let me just tell you, this is what I'm impressed with because I'm the son of a, a, a rich man, right? Um, who then became not rich because, you know, the economy went bad on him at one point, but that's a different story. This son of a rich man went and took his father's success, built on it and became a hundred times richer than his father. Let me tell you, that is impressive beyond impressive because most sons of rich men, I used to hang out with them when I was a teenager in my early 20s when my dad was still rich. Let me tell you that, man. They do not have the get up and go to get out there and create success for themselves. Most of them are like, oh, I got money. I'm cool. Look at me. I'm cool. But inside, they feel like worthless POSs because they know they didn't do it. They did nothing to earn this. And they feel awful. They feel they haven't got the talent to do it. They're just riding on mommy and daddy's coattails. So this guy, Donald Trump, businessman, is the right guy to be in charge of America right now, the right guy to be in charge of the decisions that need to be made on the economy. He is doing it with such a masterful touch. Now, you may not like, I don't know, his, his style. You may not like his bombast. 
but you can't argue with the results. If anybody else had been in charge right now, especially one of the Democrats like Ms. Ocasio-Cortez or, G heaven forbid, Joe Biden. Like, are these people crazy? Joe Biden should be with his grandkids. The guy's clearly got dementia. Like, like this is a sad thing. You're putting a guy who's got dementia at the head of a major party ticket. There's no way. There's no way that he can't. He's going to be no, no fucking way. They have to pull him. I agree with you, but so far they're not. I'm looking at this going, are you guys high? Can you imagine a debate between him and Donald Trump? Can you imagine it? <laughs> Just imagine it. Like, like by the end of that debate, he's going to be, it's going to be embarrassing for the nation. The, the people are going to see this. Even people who, you know, reasonable people. I don't mean the crazies, right? But the reasonable people who may not be crazy about Donald Trump, who may have problems with some of the things that he says and some of the ways in which he reacts with people. And I, listen, as a polite Persian boy, I got to be honest, my mom and dad, they would shoot me if I spoke to people, talk back to them the way he talks back to some of the people that attack him. And, you know, from my culture, we don't do that and we don't think that's cool behavior, right? But I got to tell you, even the people who have a problem with that, if they see a debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, I'm sorry, they're not going to put the country in the hands of the senile old guy who should be with his grandkids. It's just not going to happen. You need to have someone in charge of the country that's an adult, that's a grown-up who knows what the hell he's doing, even if he's a bit of a jackass. And I'm not saying Trump is a jackass, but some of these people think he might be. They're going to put the country in his hands. They're not going to put the country in the hands of Joe Biden. And I hope for the world's sake that you're right and they'll pull that guy and they'll put someone who's, you know, at least potentially able to run the country if he were able to win or she were able to win. But I think the Democrats are too stupid to do that. I'm sorry to say this, but they are they are they are nasty and evil in some ways, but they're not very smart. They don't really understand what it takes to actually be successful in the world today. And that, you know, is good for Trump. I'm not so, so sure it's good for the world. I'm not so sure it's good for the United States. And I also want to say this. It's very, very important that we as people hold the politicians' feet to the fire. Like, I salute these Americans that are protesting the government overreach of some of their governors. And I think we here in Canada should be doing that. Like, did you read the story about that father with a four-year-old girl, uh, daughter? They were in the park by themselves, and the guy got fined $1,000? Like, are you kidding me? Like, we should be grabbing the pitchforks and storming the barracks over that and say, screw that, man. That guy wasn't doing anything wrong. He didn't put anybody at risk. He was out with his little girl. Don't find him. Don't find us. That's ridiculous. What are you doing currently right now in this uh, chaos? So, so, brother, thank you for that question. There's a, a number of things. I'm reading a lot. So I'm up to 45 books this year. And mm. I, I have an eclectic reading list. I read a lot of uh, fiction uh, I, I, I read some of the great masters in detective fiction uh, from the Donald Westlake, Ro uh, Lawrence Block, um, Robert Parker, folks like that. Um, I'm currently reading an autobiography by Robert K. Brown. This is mm -hmm. the book. I'm uh, a soldier of fortune. Oh, I heard about this. Yeah, yeah. Dude, you've got to read this book. Okay. This guy I am, yeah. Great. He's freaking crazy. <laughs> he's, he's crazy. So this guy... Um, he he was he was a uh, a student that went and uh, joined the army, and in the late fifties, right? He was he joined the um, the group of idealistic Americans who went to Cuba to liberate it from Batista and mm -hmm. give it to, to Castro. Mm -hmm. Within six months of Castro winning, showing his true colors, he became a vir a virulent anti-Castro, anti-communist. So he went and he fought against Castro. <laughs> then he joined the U.S. Army. He went to Vietnam. He fought in Vietnam, and he was a badass. Like, I'm talking like like a stone-cold killer, but with, 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 with a smile on his face. He went, and then he started um, becoming a bit of a soldier of fortune, uh, after he left the army, he started the Soldier of Fortune magazine. He went to Rhodesia to uh, fight uh, against Mugabe. Mugabe was portrayed as this great liberator, but Mugabe was a vicious, brutal Marxist terrorist killer who killed hundreds of thousands of people. 
He fought against Mugabe with the with the Ian Smith government. Then he went to Laos to try and get some U.S. Uh, POWs out of Vietnam. He went to El Salvador, Afghanistan to fight against the Soviets. Afghanistan against to fight against the the freaking Taliban. His story is amazing, and like the stuff they did is cool. And Soldier of Fortune magazine, brother, was headquartered, and in fact still is headquartered. You know, it's online only now. Um, in Boulder, Colorado. Now, Boulder is one of the most leftist towns in North mm -hmm. America. They mm -hmm. call it the People's Republic of Boulder, right? So this extremely right-wing, conservative, gun-toting, soldier of fortune, mercenary guy had his magazine in this left-wing <laughs> town. Man, it's just, I love it. So I'm reading a lot. I'm doing a lot of podcast interviews on my own show. I'm interviewing a bunch of really cool people. I interviewed the um, Ryan Mickler from Order of Man. Have you heard of Order of Man? Mm -hmm. He's a really, really cool guy. I just I read his book a little while ago, and we talked about his book yesterday, Sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Great book. And um, I'm going to be interviewing Mark Victor Hansen, the founder of uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul with mm. along with Jack Canfield. They've sold like 500 million copies of that book. It's insane. Uh, of, of that series, I should say, not just the one book. So he's kind of cool. And the other thing I've been doing, brother, is I do a lot of uh, talks. Believe it or not, people right now want talks. So I'm going on Zoom and I'm doing talks to inspire people. So when you and I are done, I actually have a talk to a group of realtors. They're like stuck in their home. They're worried, am I ever going to do business again? And I want to help them get that off their chest, mm. show them how magnificent they truly are, show them they can have control over their own life. And I tell them, I have this line that I borrowed from Winston Churchill. This is your finest hour if you let it be your finest hour. You remember he said that in one of his speeches? He said, if the British Empire and its Commonwealth were to last a thousand years, men would still say this was their finest hour. So I say, if the free enterprise system were to last 10,000 years, and God willing it will, men and women would still say that the time of the COVID-19 were when men and women stood up, stood for freedom, stood for uh, victory, and this was their finest hour. So I do those kinds of talks to get people pumped up so they can go out there and, and be empowered. I'm working out every day, seven days a week. I go play some basketball with my sons. Uh that's a little harder because we got to find a private basketball place because everything shut down and they're mm -hmm. fighting you and I don't want a thousand dollar fine. So those are the sorts of things that I've kind of been up to, brother. And obviously staying in touch with like-minded people like yourself, man. It's it's uh it's it's the only way to not let this lockdown drive me crazy, man. Because I'm going a little stir crazy being in my house all the time, you know. I saw the other day that there's some good backlash. I was happy about it where the John Tory put up a fucking snitch hotline. Just think about that. Like the government encourages you to snitch on your compatriots. Disgusting. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. John Tory should be ashamed of himself. In my opinion, that man for doing that belongs in a prison cell. That's tyranny. That's tyranny, man. And the crazy thing is people agreeing with that. Really? Ah, man, like, listen, most people, I I'm going to say this, most people are incompetent, especially in this climate. Most people will gladly trade in their, let's say, trade in their security, trade in their privacy, trade in all their rights for a sense of protection. Mm. And we've seen this time and time. This is a, this is classical Marxist red handbook play of snitching yeah. on your neighbors. It is. Um, and you got, you can relate, you know, from Iran, I bet it happened there. I know it happened in Yugoslavia. I know I got firsthand oh, accounts, your neighbors, your own fucking neighbors snitching on you. Yep. They did that to us, man, because we were Christians. See? They, yeah. It's fucked up, bro. It's, it's fucked, fucked up. up. And so for me, I always look at, never forget like politicians and, and, and people who are in power, absolute power corrupts, absolute all. And regardless of if you're on the left side or the right side, Politics is an act of aggression. It's either my way or the highway. And so I always say like socialists have this like utopia dream, but I'm like, at the end of the day, you still want power. Regardless, mm -hmm. of, regardless of how you want to afflict the power or regardless of your economic policies, you still want power. And so they have cognitive dissonance when I bring that up. <laughs> they do. 
Like you want power. You want to dictate your set of rules to me. Yeah. And like, no, no, no. I'm like, but you do. You want me to vote for you and you want to sit in that nice gold chair up there as a plec- as like a technocrat or whatever you want to call it, oligarchy. And you want to dictate from your high chair up there your so-called moral ethical values onto me. It's true, brother. 100%. You know, um, Ben Franklin said, people who want to trade um, a, a, their freedom for a bit of security will have neither. Right? And mm-hmm. he was right. Mm-hmm. He was right. And Margaret Thatcher said, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. Mm-hmm. She was right. The challenge that we people, we freedom lovers today face, my brother, is very simple. They are trying to silence us mm-hmm. because they know we have the better argument. So if they start calling people like us um, heartless, racist, sexist, xenophobic, then they win because they silence us because we don't want to be called that. Nobody wants to be called that. But the truth of the matter is they know they know in their heart and in their soul that they're wrong and that we're right. That freedom is more powerful as an idea than control. And freedom is what innately every human being wants. Inside the heart of every man and every woman is the living, beating heart of liberty and the desire to breathe free, to get to live life on your terms, your way, is something that we all know is what our creator gave us. And we do not want to give it up and as long as there are voices like us who stand up for freedom and stand up to the bullies who lie in the most disgusting way to call us these names then the human race is has the chance to still fulfill its destiny and each individual man and woman can do that we cannot let these guys win that argument and we must remember The people who falsely accuse others of racism, sexism, xenophobia, heartlessness are doing it because they have one finger pointed at you and three fingers pointed back at themselves because that's what they are. And they know it. And we got to call that out. When I get called that, when someone says that, I say, listen, you little fucktard. And I don't usually swear. I'm actually... Somebody who's lived through racism. I was in Iran. They threw a goddamn Molotov cocktail through my family's window and on it said, die Christian scum. So Mm. shut the fuck up. Excuse my French. And don't talk to me about this because you've never experienced it and I actually have. And secondly, what I know and what every real minority person knows is that people who loudly proclaim they're not racist are the biggest Biggest racist. racist they are. Yeah. And... We have no time for you and your bullshit. And I got to be honest, whenever I've been accused of racism, this is the one time where I go full Donald Trump on them. I hit them back 100 times harder than they hit me. So when someone said, hey, are you a racist? I go, no, but are you a racist? Do you believe that you have the right to tell a Middle Eastern man that he can't speak? You believe that only white people can speak because it's usually white liberals? Mm -hmm. You think us Middle Easterners need to shut our mouths? Is that what you think? And I go hard in their face with that and they melt. They wilt. They back off because they know I'm right and I'm telling the truth and they don't want to. No, 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 no. Yeah, and I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, you're racist. You're racist. You're racist. And they back off. And that's what we all have to do. When they falsely accuse us of that shit, we got to hit them back harder, right in their face. But so those, they, those people are all useful idiots. Like, for example, we talked about this before, but you look at the Iranian revolution that they had in the 70s, right? And you had all these students protesting and storming the embassy and all that. You think any of those students benefited from the revolution? I bet half of those students disappeared somewhere, never to be seen again. And the uh, fucking sociopaths came into power, stripped the country of the wealth, and put their little families in charge and everybody else will uh will put you in our magical gulags that no one even knows about exactly that's what happened you're 100 percent correct and that that is something that will happen here if we allow it so we've got to be vigilant we got to hit back against the narratives we got to be 
ourselves at a grassroots level fighting for what what is right and what's ours because we cannot rely on the politicians to do it for us man most of them are scared and they're going to cave in to anybody especially if it means they can hang on to power for just mm -hmm. a little while longer yeah so do you have any final words for people what can they do right now uh to kind of better themselves so I'll tell you something, brother. There are a few things that I think every man or woman listening to this should do. Number one is every day, get up and exercise. Even if you're cooped up in your house, even if you have no equipment, you can use your body and do a lot of good stuff. There's all kinds of apps available on devices that can set up timers to do interval workouts. You can just decide to say, I'm going to do sit-ups, push-ups, squats, I mean, you don't need anything for that, right? You can just do 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, until you're exhausted, right? Mm -hmm. So do that every day because that's going to that's gonna boost all kinds of good things inside the, the pharmacy in your body and boost your immune system. So that'll make you safer and make your, 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 your ability to fight off any infection stronger. So number one, make sure you do that. Number two, man, drink lots of, of water. Drink lots of water, lay off alcohol and find good foods that you can eat and lay off bad foods. I haven't been perfect on this myself, but I, I, just, I kicked my own ass a couple of days ago because I, I, I went and I, I overindulged on these cheese buns I bought at the, at the <laughs> organic store. Man. I fucking, they're delicious, but I felt like, I felt like crap afterwards. Right. Yeah. So eat good food, drink lots of water. Third man, read books, 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 books. I got a book. If you don't mind, if I give a shameless, sure, yeah, for go for it. so this book, is called the thought leader's journey i wrote it it's a phenomenal book i'm a good writer it's a like told in the form of a story like the monk who sold his ferrari and the the um uh what's it called the greatest salesman in the world great book really will help you think about your your journey as a man or as a woman in business and then this is a book i wrote from my work with olympic champion athletes and world record holders called finish line thinking it's basically a really good primer for how to think like a winner, how to think like the person who wins at the highest level. So read books and hopefully if you like mine, order them on, on Amazon, whatever, it's good. And then the final thing I'm going to say is don't make this about what you feel. Every day, do what Amir's doing now. Reach out to a human being in your life, maybe one you haven't talked to who might be feeling lonely and let them know that you care about them, that you're here for them, that you're not going to let them falter, you're not going to let them down. And if you do that every day to one or two people, man, I think you're going to feel better about life. And then finally, man, make sure that you continue to listen to Amir's podcast because this guy is the real deal. He is authentic. He's real. He doesn't BS. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He just tells it to you like it is. And in this day and age, we need this man's voice more than ever. So that's my advice to the people, brother. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. If people want to get a hold of you and know more about you, what's the best resource? So I've got this really cool thing called a 360 site. And it, it, the, my 360 site is N-I-C-K-Y-360.com. And on that site, there's everything Nikki. So there's like these master classes I do, my podcasts, how to get a hold of me with email, phone, everything, all my social media. It's kind of cool. You should look into it yourself. My One of these guys uh, that I ran into and back in the day when we could actually have live events, he did a presentation on it. I went into that event going, I'm not going to spend any money. This is going to be a pitch fest. Screw that. And what did I do as soon as I saw him? I spent the money. <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it. I like it. It's fun. And that's the best way to, uh, to get a hold of me. Nikki, thank you so much, brother. I always appreciate it. Amir, brother, God bless you, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for letting me rant and rave for a little while. <laughs> My pleasure, man.